As in the last video, I want to look at some more basic parallels between Mark's Gospel and Homer's Odyssey, but this time I want to examine one parallel in detail first that might just cause the more skeptical among you to at least scratch your collective chins. In the Odyssey, Odysseus encounters many supernatural foes and overcomes them. One of the supernatural foes Odysseus encounters is the giant Cyclops Polyphemus, who lives in a cave by the sea. Odysseus arrives by boat and takes 12 of his best men with him to the cave of the Cyclops, but he tells the rest of his men in his other ships to stay in the ships and wait. Odysseus is hoping to find hospitality, but instead, the Cyclops captures Odysseus and his men. Polyphemus kills several of them and eats a few in the process. The Cyclops then gets drunk with wine and asks Odysseus what his name is. Odysseus replies, nobody. Odysseus then blinds Polyphemus and the Cyclops cries out, help, nobody is harming me, nobody is harming me. Well, obviously, his Cyclops buddies don't come to his rescue because nobody's harming him. Later, Odysseus and his men escape by riding on the underside of the Cyclops' sheep. And once back in his ship, Odysseus taunts the Cyclops verbally by telling him he is not nobody, but Odysseus, king of Ithaca. This story from the Odyssey was known by anyone living in the first century who could read and write Greek, and certainly Mark would fall in that category as well. Homer's tale was widely known, but the question still remains. Did Mark borrow from the Cyclops story in order to write one of the memorable scenes in his own epic adventure? Let's compare the account of the demon-possessed man to the Cyclops story and you decide. Like Odysseus, Jesus sailed in a ship accompanied with other ships. He had a crew of men and they sailed to a distant land. And in fact, Mark even says it's a distant country called Gadaranes. And like Odysseus, Jesus' men stay in the ship while he disembarks. But in this case, Jesus alone goes to face the danger. Again, Mark has depicted Jesus as greater than Odysseus by altering Homer's story. Odysseus had 12 men with him when he faced his danger, but Jesus would face his danger alone. Jesus finds a man coming out of the tombs who is possessed by demons, a supernatural foe as was Odysseus's adversary. It is interesting that Mark places the man inside tombs, which is very much like a cave, a carved out place large enough to walk into. And as in Homer's story, where Polyphemus asks Odysseus his name, we see that this request for a name has been retained in Mark's version, yet inverted. In Mark, it is Jesus asking the monster for its name. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? The demons reply, legion, for we are many, which is another wordplay just like nobody was in Homer's tale of the Cyclops. Mark has again retained what he copied from Homer and inverted it or altered it to improve upon his predecessor. Whereas nobody is equal to zero men, Mark's legion is equal to 2,000 men, the number of men in a Roman legion. Jesus defeats the demons as Odysseus defeated the Cyclops, and once again, Mark retains a rather unique part of the story, an escape by riding a herd of animals. Yet once again, Mark inverts his source by having the demons ride away inside the body of pigs whereas Odysseus's men escaped by riding on the underside of a herd of sheep. Jesus leaves the scene by ship, just as Odysseus did, and just after entering the ship, like Odysseus, Jesus calls back to the man on the shore. But instead of taunting him, as Odysseus did, Jesus tells the man to proclaim the good things God has done for him, yet another improvement by Mark upon Homer's original hero. Whereas Odysseus succumbed to pride and arrogance upon departing by declaring his kingship to the Cyclops, Jesus did not proclaim his own kingship or identity, but instead gave the credit to God. Now, let's put the main points from both scenes 
on the screen in the order in which they occur so we can better tell if there's anything to this strange coincidence of details between Homer's fiction and Mark's history. Odysseus sails with several ships and with a crew of men to a distant land, the land of the Cyclops. Jesus sails with several ships and a crew of men to a distant land, the land of the Gadaranes. Odysseus disembarks and tells all but 12 of his crew to stay in the ships. Jesus disembarks and goes alone while all 12 of his crew members remain in the ship. Odysseus immediately meets the Cyclops Polyphemus in a cave. Jesus immediately meets a man possessed by demons coming out of a cave or a tomb. The Cyclops asks Odysseus his name. Jesus asks the demon-possessed man his name. Odysseus says his name is Nobody, a clear wordplay. The demons tell Jesus their name is Legion, a clear wordplay. Odysseus blinds the Cyclops, thus defeating him. Jesus sends the demons from the man, thus defeating them. Odysseus and his remaining men escape by riding on the underside of sheep. The demons escape the man by riding inside of pigs. Odysseus and his men enter the ship again. Jesus enters his ship. Odysseus calls back to the shore and taunts the Cyclops. Jesus calls back to the shore, but does not reveal his true identity or take the credit. The number of parallels between the Cyclops' tale and the tale of the demon-possessed man are many, and they are unique as well as sequential. What seals the deal for me is the uniqueness of the two parallels, the request for a name, which results in an obvious wordplay by the author and the escape sequence of riding in or under a herd of animals. Is this just mere coincidence? Or was Mark trying to hit a homer? Okay, let's finish up this vid with a look at a few more basic parallels. In the Odyssey, Odysseus meets a dead prophet named Tiresias while he's in Hades, the Greek notion of an underworld. In Mark, Jesus meets two dead prophets, Elijah and Moses. And again, Mark tries to improve upon the Odyssey because Jesus doesn't go to them, they come to Jesus. In the Odyssey, Odysseus eats a last supper with his comrades in the halls of the witch Circe before going down to Hades. In Mark, Jesus and his comrades eat a last supper before Jesus departs into the land of the dead. In the Odyssey, all of Odysseus' crew members die and only Odysseus survives. In Mark, the author has inverted this and all of Jesus' crew members survive while Jesus dies. Only later does Judas kill himself in remorse, but Mark again improves upon Homer, for his hero is depicted as greater than Odysseus, for he survived not only his trials and tribulations, but death itself. Now, the last thing I want to look at before I wrap this video up is another sweeping motif that pervades both the Odyssey and Mark's story. In the Odyssey, Odysseus's travels are almost always accommodated by ship ending at some adventure once disembarking. He also takes 12 shipmates from his fleet into the cave of Polyphemus, as we looked at earlier. In Mark, we learn that Jesus apparently traveled frequently by ship, and in fact, did this more in Mark's tale than either Matthew's or Luke's. And of course, Jesus has 12 shipmates. And he spoke to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. Why would Mark impart such a detail, unless perhaps he was giving his readers another flag, pointing them toward his source, the Odyssey? And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And when the evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. 
And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. And when they got out of the ship, the people immediately recognized him. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples, and came into the parts of Dalmanutha. And he left them, and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. In no other gospel does Jesus do so much sailing. The question I have is, where did Jesus procure such large ships at precisely the locations and moments he needed them? Surely even his poor fishermen disciples didn't have so many large ships that could accommodate 13 men just sitting around waiting for Jesus to need them. And Mark treats the Sea of Galilee as if it was the Mediterranean. Huge, deep, mysterious, prone to violent storms, large enough to capsize a boat with 13 men in it. Obviously, Mark had never even been to Palestine. The Sea of Galilee is more like a lake. Perhaps an elegant answer to this strange seafaring Jesus we find in Mark's story is that Mark was simply copying Odysseus's mode of transportation, which would explain the other little ships, as well as the fact that Jesus even had a ship large enough for 13 men. And the parallels don't stop. I'm saving the best for last, of course. In the next couple of vids, I'll be cooking up a mess of vittles you won't want to miss. Mm -mm. Oh, and don't worry about the tab. It's all on me.